Are we talking about um, a social taboo that is present in a country like the Netherlands, but also in other countries in the Western world, if you will? And it's a, a taboo in parenting um, about talking about race. So I'm talking about colorblind parenting. Uh, the question is, is, does it exist? Does that really happen? And or, or really doesn't it? So what do I mean when I talk about colorblind parenting? I'm talking about people um, pretending like they don't see differences between different racial groups and um, actually avoiding the topic uh, altogether. So saying, I don't see differences in color and I don't talk about it, it's just not an issue. So that's what I mean when I say colorblind parenting or a colorblind strategy when it comes to talking about race. So um, one of the ways that we in, in, in my, my research group try to study this colorblind strategy is by playing a game called, yeah, who is it? I don't know if you've seen that before. So you, what you have to do is you ask a question, somebody picks one card and the opponent has to ask yes and no questions to figure out which card you have, which person you picked. And the best way to win this game is to ask the 50-50 questions. So where half of the you know, possible persons are eliminated because of your question. So we made a special version based on an American study. And it's a special version, um, not just with white people, because all the uh, other versions are just with white people. And this is a version with half white people, half black people, half women, half uh, men, and half children and half adults. So these would be the three smart questions to ask to figure out who your opponent has picked in terms of a person. So then we did this test with uh, several hundreds of participants and also with a specific group of parents of young children. And they were playing it with their child. So their child had a picture. So their child got to hear what sort of strategies, what sort of questions their parents were asking to win this game. Now, what we saw happen is that uh, games with questions about, this is the percentage. So in all the games that we identified, everybody asked about sex, about gender. So everybody said, is it a male? And then you said no or yes, and then half the you know, uh, pictures would disappear. But only half of the people actually asked about skin color, whereas it's also a 50-50 question. And uh, age was also talked about a little less probably because it was less clear, but it's very clear here that the race question is avoided. Now, it wasn't just avoided, it was avoided even when it was difficult to avoid. So, for example, we would have people with just these two left. I'll walk a little bit so the other half can also see them. They're Milo and Mace. Um, so what's the big difference between these two kids? <laughs> <laughs> and people would literally go, um... Um... Does he have spiky hair? Does he have a white collar? And they would ask all the questions except for the question that you can see right in front of them. If people did ask the race question, they would normally be very hesitant about it. So they'd go, is he, um, does he, um, I'm not sure how to ask this. And they would really take a long time before they would say, is he white or black or dark skinned, or they would use a variety of terms, but they would never just come straight out. So this is a bit of a taboo. So parents were basically, um, giving their children the message, like, this is not an easy question. Um, and so really pointing towards something that's really clearly visible to not be talked about. Now, one of the reasons that parents don't talk about it because they have the idea that children are colorblind. This is often said, right? Children don't see rays, they don't see it. Well, I've got a surprise for you, or maybe not for you guys, but research shows that, oh, I'm going to point that way, um, that from early infancy, before children turn one year old, they can reliably distinguish between the main ethnic groups. So they can reliably distinguish between black people, white people, and Asian people, right? So this is basic perception, yeah? You would expect them to sort of see the difference, oh, I have the picture there, yeah, of different types of skin colors and different types of faces in terms of hair color, eye uh, shape, etc. So by the time children are one year old, they are no longer colorblind. So this is a misconception to start with. So people can talk about, you know, and talk about children being colorblind. This is not the case. So then what does this mean? Children see the difference. Sure. 
But do they have any um, uh, opinions about these different colored people and these different ethnic groups? Well, we uh, conducted a research here in the Netherlands with children of six to eight years old, white Dutch children, and we gave them this group of pictures. So what you see here is a group of pictures uh, with four white children, four black children, and four children that you can describe as maybe Middle Eastern looking, normally associated with the Muslim minority here in the Netherlands. And we asked all the kids different questions about these pictures. So we asked them, for example, is it there? Let's point. Yeah. So who do you want to play with? Point to one kid you want to play with. And point to a kid you don't want to play with. We also asked them. Yeah, we're very cruel sometimes. Um, we also asked them, so who would you like to sit next to in class? And who would you not want to sit next to in class? Also, wanting to pick only one. And then we ended up by asking who would you invite to your birthday? Because... <laughs> But then they could actually point to multiple, because that's the thing, if you have to choose only one, we know from research that, that can bias the results a little, so for the birthday we said you could choose whoever you want, so they were free to choose everybody in the picture. So what we found, I'm just showing one result, but it's indicative of all the results across these questions, is that to play with, the overwhelming majority of children chose a white child to play with. Um, so this was over three quarts of children, even though it was really equally represented in the pictures. Uh, then a, a smaller group chose a black child to play with, and an even smaller group, and this was a statistically significant difference, uh, meaning that the Arab children or the Middle Eastern children were even less likely than the black children to be picked to play with. Now in terms of negative question, you could sort of maybe guess that this was gonna happen, the reverse happened. So not play with, the white children were rarely chosen, the black children were chosen more often, and the Arab Middle Eastern looking children were chosen even more often to not play with. So this is clear. This is a clear, you know, this, this has been found in the United States over and over again, and it had never been researched here in the Netherlands before, and we find pretty much exactly the same as we're used to in the literature from the States. So where do these kids learn this stuff, you know? What is it, why do they think this not, maybe not so nice to play with kids with another skin color? Is it just because they're not familiar with them? Is it unknown makes unloved? Like we have a Dutch saying that, uh, that says that. Uh, one question is, so what do they get at home in terms of talking about this issue? Now we know from research, mostly from the United States, that among ethnic minorities, and it's mostly research about African-Americans, they talk about it a lot. So within ethnic minority families, parents talk about race. They talk about their own ethnic identity, they talk about their cultural heritage, they talk about experiences of discrimination and about bias and maybe mistrust of some of the institutions in their country. And then when we look at what is talked about in white majority families in like the United States, for example, is not so much. Um, it's actually to the point that when they started to do a research and they try to teach parents in workshops how to talk about race in their families, that the whole research failed because the parents refused. So there were workshops and there were positive things and there were ways to address it, and it just didn't work because maybe only one or two out of the large group of parents, most of the parents just did not. So they couldn't <coughs> test anything, they didn't have any data, they couldn't research the whole issue because the parents didn't and wouldn't. So what is it then that kids get from this? You know, if it's not talked about, then why does that, might that lead to maybe more of a negative view of, of children of a different color or a heritage? They did some interesting studies where they had some children view some videos. And they had one group of children look at a video of a black man talking to a white man. Um, and they had just a very general sort of conversation uh, about the weather, about whatever. And it was a happy conversation. And the white person would stand rather close to the black person and smile a little and, and seem comfortable and had eye contact with the black person. And then another group of kids saw the same conversation, but then more neutral and comfortable. So the white person would say exactly the same words as in the first conversation, but he would stand a bit more further away he would not make so much eye contact, he wouldn't smile so much, he just overall seemed more ill at ease. Then they asked the children, so you know, how do you like these guys? And very quickly it turned out that the 
children who had seen the first video um, liked the black person in the video a lot more than the people who had seen the second video. So the text was exactly the same. Nothing was different except for the discomfort of his conversation partner, of his white conversation partner. It wasn't just that, they were also asked so uh, to, to look at other uh, black people on pictures and say, hey, do you like this guy, do you like this guy? Turns out the kids who had seen the second video also liked the other black people less. The people they'd never met, they hadn't seen a video of. So it generalized to opinions about other people from the same race that they had just witnessed an uncomfortable situation about. And now the thing is, we know that this is the reality in a lot of interracial contact. There's been a lot of research done, and we see that in interracial contact, that there's a lot of discomfort. There's more blinking, there's higher heart rate, there's uh, more stuttering, there's longer um, uh, 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 pauses between words and sentences. So this is actually a reality. The second video is often a reality when children might be experiencing interracial contact, for example, of their parent with somebody else. So this is about non-verbal behavior, right? Just discomfort. So what else are parents transmitting to their children when it comes to this, this sort of topic? So let me see. Do, does this happen, you reckon? So this is just a very explicit sort of parenting strategy to talk about race in a family. Well, the thing is, this doesn't really happen. This is, this is very rare that people would actually go out and say, you know, these are bad, dumb people, don't play with them. So this is not the reality of how racial prejudice, maybe in some families, I can see some hesitation, I'm sure there are some families out there, but in your regular average Dutch family, this is not what you expect to hear, and we actually don't. But this, on the other hand, you're watching television, there's been some bombing, and you know, you and your husband might be <coughs> talking about things. Um, and before you know it, you know, somebody said something, ah, oh, it's those Muslims again. And you haven't said anything to your kids, Right? You're talking to your spouse, and they're in the room, and they're on the couch. The kids aren't stupid. Kids hear this sort of stuff. Um, or maybe on the playground. Did you hear about the refuge to center coming to our neighborhood? Oh yeah, it's terrible. Those people don't belong here. You know, And the kids are right there. They're right there around them. So even when parents don't think they're transmitting any racial prejudice or ethnic prejudice to their kids, they have a lot of conversations, and I'm, I'm putting on a little bit strong here, but you can imagine that there are very many subtle ways that this can happen in daily life. So children do get all sorts of racial messages without the parents actually realizing that they're giving them. So colorblind parenting, truth or fiction, it is actually fiction um, because it's actually impossible. People have opinions about other racial groups, people have feelings about other racial groups, and you cannot actually hide them even when you try to hide them. The same goes for gender-neutral socialization, no such thing. People try it, there's just no such thing, I can tell you. Um, so, why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because humans are not colorblind, simply speaking, we're not. None of us are, well, except for those who are, but they can still distinguish between light and dark skin. Racial attitudes are transmitted non-verbally, so even if you don't talk about it, there's still some messages. Mm -hmm. And racial attitudes are transmitted in daily conversations, even when you don't even think you're talking about it. So when it comes to this colorblind parenting strategy, it doesn't seem to hold any water if you look at the facts, and then maybe it is time for us to um, become comfortable with the uncomfortable. So really stop making this a taboo and to have conversations about race. And instead of being color blind, we need to be color brave. And this is a quote from Melody Hobson that I'd like to end with. <laughs>